When you think of a Land Rover, the ultra-luxurious flagship Range Rover model probably quickly comes to mind. However, the Range Rover family has always consisted of four models here in the US. At the top end, of course, is the Big Daddy Range Rover, and at the bottom end is the entry-level Evoque. However, one rung up the ladder sits the Range Rover Velar, a vehicle that we've seen in America since 2018. This is Land Rover's compact entry in the luxury SUV space, going head-to-head -head against vehicles like the BMW X3, Mercedes-Benz GLE, and Porsche Macan. Now for 2024, it's time for Land Rover to finally give this vehicle its first full round of updates, which include new styling front and rear, an updated infotainment system, and some tweaks to the suspension to give this thing slightly better driving dynamics. So as you can see this week, Land Rover has sent us over this Range Rover Velar SE Dynamic, which is kind of like the mid trim with the three liter turbocharged inline six under the hood, and of course, standard all wheel drive. So for those of you who have always wanted a Range Rover, but you don't necessarily want to break the bank on the bigger models. How does this refreshed 2024 Range Rover Velar stack up? Stay tuned to find out. Now, before we start talking about the slight styling changes that Land Rover has made for 2024, I thought I'd pop the hood and show you guys what's powering this thing. Now, in the past, when this vehicle first launched, you could take your pick between three different engines. However, Land Rover did drop the supercharged V8, which was at the top of the rung. However, my tester here has probably the more desirable option. This is the company's newest engine, a three liter turbocharged inline six uh, with a mild hybrid system. Now, as you guys probably know, uh, the Land Rover brand shares an architecture, of course, with Jaguar. They're known as JLR. And this is, of course, the company's latest inline six. It's known as Ingenium. I guess internally, that's the name of the engine. It's a three liter double overhead cam turbocharged inline six that's also electrically assisted by uh, a mild hybrid system, a 48 volt system, and it also has an electric supercharger. So it's kind of like a twin charged engine. I've already tested this motor in the latest version of the Jaguar F-Pace, which this vehicle vehicle essentially shares a platform with. The numbers here are pretty much the same as the Jag, 395 horsepower. Land Rover calls it the P400 because the horsepower is 400 in PS metric scale, and then 406 pound-feet of torque. Your other option is the P250, which is a two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder developing 247 horsepower. I haven't had a chance to drive that engine yet, but in this motor, or in this application, I think the inline six is probably going to be the one you're going to want. It all goes out through an eight-speed ZF-sourced automatic transmission. Uh, and this vehicle also comes standard with the company's all-wheel drive system with their terrain response system. Uh, this vehicle does not offer a low-range transfer case like what you're going to find in the Range Rover Sport or the Big Daddy Range Rover or the Defender. But again, most people are probably going to just enjoy having that all-wheel drive system. Fuel economy is rated at 19 in the city, 25 on the highway. This has roughly a 21-gallon fuel tank. Um, this vehicle is recommended to run on premium gas. You're looking at around 400 to 450 miles of range on a full tank. Land Rover says you should get to 60 in around 5.2 seconds. It has a top speed of around 155 miles an hour. This vehicle is an SUV. It can tow a little over 50, 5,500 pounds. And as it sits, this car weighs in at just under 4,500 pounds. But let's go ahead and close up this hood and talk about the exterior styling. Now, when the Range Rover Velar first came out back in 2018 here in the US, this is very much known as the style leader in this segment. I mean, it's interesting to me that this vehicle shares a platform with the F-Pace, but you wouldn't be able to tell looking at this car. I mean, it has the signature Range Rover design cues. This is also a new uh, gray that Land Rover is introducing this year. I believe it's called Vidar or Dakar Gray or something like that. It's a extra 1500 bucks. I'm sorry that the light's not out because you can see a beautiful metallic Fleck. My tester also has the black package, uh, which blacks out the grill, blacks out the badging. It's got that signature Range Rover grill, of course, with these full LED headlights with the pixel design. This is actually an updated design to the LED headlight, whereas now you have kind of this continuous light blade con uh, creating an LED daytime running light and turn signal. Before it had like a little circle or a rectangle in that lower portion of the headlight, but Land Rover, as you can see, has cleaned that up, taking some styling cues from the Range Rover Sport, the new one. You can see down here, there are LED fog lights with another LED light strip. And then with the black package, it kind of brought, it turns a lot of the bronze accents into these gloss black accents with these integrated parking sensors. Overall, I still think this is one of the most handsome looking SUVs in the segment. The design has definitely aged well, so 
uh, you may have to squint at it or park it next to the old model to see some of the changes that Land Rover has made. Now, moving around the side profile, what's interesting about the Velar is this vehicle is supposed to be a compact SUV, but 189 inches long. This is more along the lines of a midsize SUV. Compared to the Evoque, however, the Evoque is the entry-level model in the Range Rover family. This model is around 17 inches longer, but around six inches shorter versus the new Range Rover Sport, which I also had a chance to drive and show you guys. The wheelbase is 113 inches long. It's the same length as the Jaguar F-Pace. This vehicle is about two inches longer versus its F-Pace corporate twin. Now, looking at the wheels, my tester has an optional 21-inch diamond turn finish alloy wheel riding on a 265 by 45 R21 Michelin Latitude all-season tire. Uh, you can see it's got these big brakes. However, my tester is missing the dynamic handling package, which would roll in adaptive dampers, air suspension, and red painted brake calipers. Now, without the air suspension, this car has around 8.4 inches of ground clearance, which is fine, but the air suspension will allow you to raise it up to around 9.9, .9, so just under 10 inches. You can see there's some black trim here that is blacked out from the black package, along with the black mirror, which are electrically folding, and they have integrated turn signals. My tester also has the black contrasting roof. That panoramic sunroof does come standard. It also opens up to vent air and it has a retractable shade. And then looking at this angle here, I really love the proportion of the Velar. I mean, it has kind of like a low, wide, almost coupe-like concept car design to it. I also love the pop-out door handle as well. And then looking at the rear, you can see very slight changes to the rear taillight design. It kind of mimics what we've seen on the new Range Rover and the Range Rover Sport. You can see more blacked out accents here. The taillight has a slightly different design to the LED look with the LED turn signals, full LED taillights again, which is nice. You have a new rear bumper, of course, no visible exhaust tips on this car. Um, but uh, it's still, again, very much a handsome looking vehicle. I like how Rain Land Rover hid the rear wiper underneath the spoiler. And then there's a big third brake light that's also attached to that subtle rear spoiler. And then looking at the cargo area, this is where the Velar also has a pretty decent amount of cargo space. Now, first of all, it's got a power lift gate. You kind of expect that. Uh, and because of that long, uh, exterior length compared to the competition. Uh, this vehicle offers just under 31 uh, cubic feet of cargo space. There's no third row in this vehicle, obviously. You have some storage here. I like these aluminum kick plates. And underneath here, you can see there is a temporary spare tire. There's also room for a full-size spare, which Land Rover offers as part of a dealer accessory. That's a first aid kit. Again, a little bit more storage under there. If you fold down the uh, second row seats, Land Rover says it'll expand the cargo to around 62 cubic feet. Now that's interesting because while this car has less cargo space versus the Sport, the bigger Sport with the seats up, if you fold down the seats, this car actually has around eight more cubic feet of total cargo space versus the bigger and more expensive Range Rover Sport. So on the outside of the 2024 Range Rover Velar, you may have to squint at it to actually see the styling changes, but what about the interior changes? Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Before we step inside, however, let me show you guys the key fob. You can see this is the current Jaguar Land Rover Intelligent Access key. Um, it has the usual buttons here for lock, unlock, power lift gate. You can also flash the headlights, it looks like, and then use the panic function. No remote start from the fob, although you may be able to access that through your smartphone if you're an owner of the vehicle. You can see when the car is locked, um, it will retract the door handles, it'll power fold the mirrors. And then as you approach the vehicle, if I was farther away, it would it should pop out the door handles or you can push that button there. That will unlock the doors and then the door handles will pop back out. Now, looking at the interior, I wanna also clarify this gray is called Zadar Gray. I totally messed up the name earlier. Um, but my test car has uh, a nice color combination with the ebony cloud interior. This is the full leather interior. If you guys don't like using real animal hide, Land Rover now offers like a vegan option that they first introduced on the Evoque. But overall, you can see the two-tone look looks nice with the, with the Zadar gray. You can see uh, in terms of the door panel, the two-tone look carries over. Uh, but what I don't like, however, is the upper portion of the door panel here is, while it is soft touch, it feels like a cheap grain uh, material for the actual plastic. There's some nice leather here. I like the aluminum accented door handle there, uh, which feels nice and sturdy. Padded right here, although it could be softer. Uh, there's also that dark uh, gray wood trim veneer, which is definitely nice. Along with the piano black, you have three person memory seats. You have power windows, which are one touch for all four. Uh, which have a high quality tactile feel. And then the seats they adjust in, I believe, 14 different ways. They are heated and ventilated. My test car, however, is lacking the massaging seat function, which I believe you can get on the, the higher HSE trim. Now, stepping inside the interior with 8.4 inches of ground clearance, you have a nice, easy step in height, which is nice. And then as I get in and shut the door, 
The door has a solid sounding thunk, which adds to that impression of quality. Now, starting the vehicle up, the start stop button is right here behind the steering wheel on this portion of the dash, which it doesn't get blocked by the wheel, which is nice. When I start the car up, you can hear it, it has a mild hybrid system. So the engine just kind of whirs to life. It doesn't have a traditional start or noise. Uh, and then um, the rest of the dash, you can see, got an upgrade this year because of this new 11.4 inch infotainment system. This is their latest PIVI Pro infotainment system. It's kind of appears like it's floating in the dash. This replaces the old twin screen layout, uh, which I believe was called InTouch Duo Control or something like that. Um, this definitely looks a lot more modern and clean. We'll get into that in just a moment. You can see it also got a new steering wheel with a three spoke design. It's also got the two tone look. It has a power tilt telescoping feature, which Land Rover and Jaguar puts it on the right side as opposed to the left side of the wheel. You have paddles on the wheel itself. You have a nice stitched airbag cover the horn. It sounds appropriate given the size of the vehicle. There's also new touch sensitive controls that allow you to control that, that allow you to adjust the cruise control. You have an all digital display here, which Land Rover also lets you kind of customize the way the display looks with the two traditional dials. You can also go to a one dial, a map, a driver assistance, you know, page, all of that is relatively easy to use and it looks modern as well. The upper door panel or the upper dash material here has that same cheap feeling graining plastic, which I don't love. And then you have a hard touch plastic area here over the instrument panel hood. My tester for a thousand bucks also has the optional heads up display. There's some leather on this portion, leather over here. Same thing as the door panel that kind of carries through more of that piano black plastic. There's some traditional vents at the top here. And then over here, you can see the infotainment system has wireless Apple CarPlay in Android Auto. You can see it looks a lot more modern. This is the same system that I showed you in the Range Rover Sport and the Big Daddy Range Rover. Going back to the native system here, you can see this is their latest PIVI Pro infotainment system. You can also go click that and it'll show you all your different icons and widgets and whatnot. What I don't like, however, is Land Rover has removed the separate screen here along with the dials for the climate control. So now if you want to go to the climate control, you have to go into the screen here and then turn it on from here. That's how you saw how you go to the heated and seat cooled seat control. Thankfully, the steering wheel still has a heated, dedicated heat, heated button here. Your drive mode selector is also now located here in the screen where you can go to eco, comfort, dynamic, off-road modes, of course. You can go to a terrain response. You can change it to gravel and sand, mud and ruts. Um, a comfort setting again. So this to me uh, is kind of a step backwards, but for those of you who like touch controls and you like more of that cleaner design, you're obviously going to you know, have to get used to this. Uh, the climate will always be over here and then the rest of the screen is over here. If you push that button here, you can see it brings up the full 360 camera, um, which again, the quality and the resolution has definitely improved over the years. I also like how it takes up the entire screen. Um, the screen itself, you can see the response is a little bit faster, but it's not quite as fast as some of the other competing systems like the new BMW iDrive 8. But again, this definitely looks a lot more modern versus the old system. Put the vehicle into reverse, you can see uh, the mirrors will fold down or tilt down, and then it gives you parking sensors front and rear. Um, down here where there used to be dials now, there's more of that shadow gray wood. If you open that up, you can see there's your wireless phone charging pad and a USB-C charging port, a little bit of storage. So I like the fact that Land Rover gave you back some storage. There's a, a new shifter here before, instead of the dial that raises up, instead now you push this little trigger, push it forward to go to reverse push it back to go to drive. There's also a sport mode there, push that button to go to park. This is definitely a cleaner look, but again, some of the creakiness that I'm feeling in the plastics don't feel great. The wood feels good, but this piano black is gonna show scratches and fingerprints annoyingly. Cup holders here, you have a nice padded center console. And then if you open this up, you can see it offers another USB, two USB ports, a C and an A, a decent amount of storage uh, in there as well. Uh, the seats, I don't particularly love the seats, the way they look. Uh, the leather feels more like pleather to me, but the heat and ventilation works fine. Again, you can get a massaging seat. I would like to see the a Land Rover badge embossed in the actual head restraint. Uh, you can see the glove compartment is a bin style. It's damped and it's lined with felt. It doesn't have that twin glove box design like some other Land Rover products. There's some LED map lighting in here and some ambient lighting, but my tester is missing the climate comfort package, or I'm sorry, it's missing the um, some upgrade package that gives you the interchangeable LED lighting. This one just has the standard lighting. Um, but overall, the interior, uh, it looks nice. It definitely looks a lot more modern, but you definitely have lost some functionality with the traditional hard buttons. The Meridian sound system in this car is the standard one. And it also makes some good sounds if you guys are audiophiles. There's also an upgrade system if you guys prefer. But let's go ahead and hop into the back seat of the Velar because this model here has a decent amount of space, although that's where I have the seat to drive. The seats don't recline, but they do fold down to expand the cargo capacity. Land Rover says you have just around 37 inches of legroom. That's an inch less versus what you get in the Range Rover Sport, which is a bigger vehicle. You can see getting back here, this is where I have the seat to drive. Let me close the door. 
The door sounds pretty nice and solid as well. You can see same materials, cheap, but nice leather over here and more of that beautiful wood. Uh, there's good foot space under here. There's a big hump that intrudes on the middle passenger. I can get here and cross my legs, but you can see it just feels a little bit on the tight side. You do have rear seat air vents back here, USB charging ports and heated rear seats, which is nice. And then you also have an armrest that folds down and gives you uh, cup holders and whatnot. The panoramic roof also comes into the back. This does open up to vent air and there's also a retractable shade. In terms of headroom, you can see when I lean back, the headroom space is good for me, but if you're over six feet, you might notice a slight reduction in headroom. But overall, you can see the back seat is certainly usable for adults, but if you guys require more uh, space, you might wanna check out some of the competition. So it's been about four years since I had a chance to drive a Land Rover Range Rover Velar. And the last one that I drove was a special one-off model that was kind of like uh, the performance SVR version, although Land Rover called it the SV Autobiography. Regardless, it had a supercharged five liter V8 that was just glorious. I mean, unfortunately, you can't get that engine anymore in the Velar family, but I am driving currently the top engine. This has uh, Land Rover's or JLR's new uh, three liter uh, turbocharged inline six electrically assisted by a 48 volt hybrid system and an electric supercharger. So it's kind of like a twin charge engine. Uh, with 395 horsepower, 406 pound feet of torque, Land Rover says this model can get to 60 in around 5.2 seconds. Now, I've tested this engine in the Big Daddy Range Rover last year, um, where that vehicle was considerably heavier. Now we're driving a car that's around 4,500 pounds. Uh, there is a sport mode here, although my tester is missing the dynamic handling package, which would give it adaptive dampers and an air suspension. But I have it in its dynamic mode now. I also have the transmission in its sport mode. Um, so let's go ahead and see what we can get here in terms of acceleration in real world testing. We'll brake torque it. Sounds nice. Quick shifts from the eight speed. All right, we got 5.5 seconds there, which I think is a pretty decent time, although it's not quite as fast as what Land Rover claims at 5.2. Um, keep in mind that this car here with this powertrain compares favorably with vehicles like the Genesis GV70 with its 3.5 liter turbocharged V6, the BMW X3 M40i, a Mercedes AMG GLC 43, of course, an Audi SQ5. And then of course, there's also the Jaguar F-Pace, which is riding on the same platform as, as this vehicle. So, 5.5 is acceptable, but I believe some of the uh, German competitors like the BMW should probably be about a second faster versus this. Uh, but again, you don't necessarily buy this vehicle for the quickest zero to 60 times, but you also want it to be on the faster end. Let's try it here on this stretch. This time we won't brake torque it, we'll just floor it. Gotta love an inline six. 5.8 seconds there, so. Obviously, this one's more slightly uphill. Um, for those of you, again, who prefer the sound of an inline six, I think it's probably worth the upgrade. The other option is that two liter turbo four, which has like 247 horsepower. Land Rover says that model will probably take 7.2 seconds. So I'd say go with this model. It's probably around two seconds faster in the real world. And you also get that smoothness of that inline six, which is just lovely. Now, I will say that the eight speed auto in this car is built by ZF. Uh, and I, there were times that I was driving this vehicle that I noticed a slight hesitation, which is interesting to me because Land Rover says that they've tweaked the electric supercharger to give you a little bit more boost uh, at lower ends to kind of uh, mitigate the lag that you feel with the turbochargers. But what I noticed about this car is when I first put my foot down, it feels a little bit sluggish, put my foot down a little bit harder, then it takes off a little with too much authority uh, and it's a little jerky. So it takes a second to be smooth. Uh, I also noticed the ride quality in this car. My tester has the diamond turned 21 inch wheels, which they look great. Uh, the ride quality in this car isn't quite as smooth as you know the big, the bigger Range Rovers like the Range Rover Velar, or I'm sorry, the Range Rover Sport or the Big Daddy Range Rover. You can get this car with an air suspension, which my tester is missing with the dynamic handling package. I probably would check that option box just to give the ride quality more of a controlled feel. And you can also raise and lower the suspension. I just noticed the car's suspension feels wallowy, but it doesn't drive sporty. And then when I hit bumps, it just has too much rebound. Uh, it needs a little bit more rebound control. Um, so for me, I just found a better ride quality in some of the other competing vehicles. A Porsche Macan also is another vehicle that comes to mind. And that vehicle has similar style and even more in terms of handling prowess and performance. Now, all wheel drive comes standard in this car and you felt I felt it there, it's jerky in that instance. But I mean, overall, I think when you drive this vehicle normally, I'll set the vehicle into its comfort setting here. It'll kind of remove some of the 
aggressive throttle tip in, but then you feel more the lag. So that's not something that I really prefer. Uh, I don't like how Land Rover has moved the drive mode selector into the screen. Uh, there used to be a separate dial for it that you had to push in and then adjust the drive modes there or button. Now it's in the screen, so it's another separate step. But once you're driving this vehicle, normally the, um, you know, I think the ride is uh, acceptable on a smoother pavement. It's just on the rougher pavements, you're gonna notice that. Uh, and in terms of the handling, you can see the steering is quick and responsive, but there's just a lot of, you know, wallowing around. This is an interesting, you know, difference between the Jaguar F-Pace because the F-Pace definitely feels a lot more sportier. It seems like Land Rover has tuned this, tuned the sportiness out, you know, in pursuit of more luxury. But I think that uh, for the Velars mission, it would have been nice for them to keep that sportiness. But just driving this normally, you can feel the N-Line 6 has a really great smooth sound. Um, the transmission, when you're not driving it aggressively, also has quick and smooth shifts. This is definitely gonna be a better transmission versus the nine speed that you're gonna find in the Evoque, which is again, one step below this. Uh, and then in terms of visibility, I can see out of the front and the side pretty well. Actually, this pillar is not as fat as I thought. The rear view is also not bad, although my tester is lacking like a digital camera review mirror. I believe Land Rover offers that on the HSE trim, but not on this mid-level you know, SE trim. Uh, and then in terms of the driver assistance tech, Land Rover has the standard adaptive cruise control, automatic emergency braking, lane keep assist. It works well enough, but it's not, you know, not as, um, high tech as some of the other German brands you're gonna test out from other manufacturers that just have more hands-free, that have active lane changing uh, assist. In terms of the way the you know rest of the infotainment system works with the new screen, the new steering wheel, the new infotainment system, it all makes for a much more modern looking cabin uh, and the cabin is also nice and quiet. That's the one thing is if you don't push the engine, which already makes a lovely sound, uh, the road noise is very low, the wind noise is very low, you get the sense that you're driving a vehicle that feels like a tank, even though it doesn't feel quite as, you know, king of the road as the Range Rover Sport or the Range Rover Velar, or um, the, Range, the Big Daddy Range Rover. I keep mixing up the names. There's too many names with this with this brand, this sub-brand. Uh, and then in terms of the fuel efficiency, um, my test car in a week's worth of testing has been averaging right under 21 MPG, which is you know, pretty close to what the EPA says the combined rating is. On the highway, I got it up to around 24 MPG, which is not bad. You're looking at at least 400 miles of range between fill-ups. You could push it as high as 450, maybe even closer to 500 if you guys drive it more economically, which you can do, um, but I definitely enjoyed pushing the engine a little bit more just to hear the sweet sounds from under the hood with the inline six. You know, but overall the Velar definitely has a more road going feel. It feels lower to the ground. It feels like a slightly bigger version of the Jaguar F-Pace, which the F-Pace already, already drives well enough. But I can see why the Range Rover Sport outsells this thing two to one because, you know, at the price that Land Rover is asking for the Velar, you're basically paying for style. It just doesn't have that same kind of tank-like, king of the road feel that you get from the Sport or the Big Daddy Range Rover. And I think that's something that really draws people over into the Range Rover family. Um, so it's interesting that the Velar doesn't have it. Obviously the last one I drove had the V8 and I really fell in love with the engine. But with the inline six, it's perfectly acceptable. I just don't know if it's worth the extra coin considering the fact that you can get, you know, a BMW, a Mercedes, an Audi, um, for about $10,000 less, or you could get a Porsche Macan for similar money, although the Porsche might end up being a little bit more expensive, but you'll get more performance, better handling. Uh, you'll still have sleek style, of course, with Porsche and, and such, but overall, the Velar, to me, is still a great option, but it just doesn't have the same kind of, you know, standout feel that you might get from some of its competitors, which are cheaper. So when the Range Rover Velar first came out in the US back in 2018, it actually did pretty well for Land Rover with the company selling just under 20,000 units annually. Remember, this competes right in the heart of the compact SUV segment, although Land Rover does charge a premium for the Velar because of the Range Rover name and just how sleek and stylish this vehicle has always been. Sadly for Land Rover, however, the company only managed to sell a little under 7,000 units in the US last year, so sales have been tanking. So uh, that's one of the reasons why obviously Land Rover was forced to give this thing some updates. So as you guys saw, the styling changes pretty much haven't really, you know, 
altered the way this car looks and feels. It still is instantly recognizable as a Range Rover or part of the Range Rover family. It's one of the most sleek SUV designs out there. It's aged extremely well. The interior upgrades with the new infotainment system, the 11.4 inch screen running their new PV Pro infotainment system with wireless CarPlay certainly looks a lot more modern, but I think Land Rover also took a step backwards by getting rid of some of the physical controls like the dials for the climate controls for the heated seats, for example. I kind of wish that Land Rover had kept that in the interior, but I suspect that it's probably something that owners will likely get used to. The back seat area has pretty average amounts of interior space. Cargo room is on the higher end of the scale, but really where I have an issue with the Range Rover Velar is the fact that it doesn't quite give you that tank-like king of the road feel that you get in the larger Range Rover Sport. Now, obviously something has to give when you're driving a vehicle that is built off of a slightly different architecture, the Jaguar F-Pace architecture. But I also am sad to say, or sad to see that this vehicle doesn't drive quite as sporty as the F-Pace. I mean, the F-Pace is one of the sportier driving SUVs along with the Porsche Macan. This vehicle here feels like it's been tuned more for comfort and maybe even for off-road capability, which is why it doesn't feel quite as sporty to drive out on the road, which is fine for those of you who prefer a luxury car. But again, the ride quality in this vehicle isn't quite up to the same snuff that I've tested in something like the Genesis GV70 or a Porsche Macan. So my recommendation would be try out this vehicle with the dynamic handling package that gives you the adaptive dampers and adaptive air suspension, which should again improve the ride quality and the handling dynamics of this car. Now, if you guys are looking to purchase the 2024 for Range Rover Velar. This vehicle is on sale already and it's uh, starting price is going to be considerably higher versus a lot of its rivals. At a base price of just over $61,500 plus destination for the base S model, that includes standard all-wheel drive for the P250 with the four-cylinder. That represents about a $12,000 you know, price delta versus the base price of a BMW X3, an Audi Q5, or a Mercedes-Benz GLC, or a Lexus NX. I'd argue that the Land Rover brand does give you the promise of off-road capability, which you're not going to technically find in a lot of its other uh, rivals. However, $12,000 is a big hefty premium. This is actually still around $4,000, I'm sorry, $5,000 more versus even a Jaguar F-Pace. Now my tester here being the SE uh, mid-level trim, it's only around $3,000 more, but if you want the six cylinder engine, that's an extra $7,000 more. So with the six cylinder engine, this vehicle here starts at around 70 grand. With some of the options that my test car has, like the black package, the black contrasting roof, the cold climate package, the 21 inch wheels, this color upcharge with destination, all in my test car comes in at just over $81,000. I know 81 grand is expensive. That's easily $10,000 more versus a BMW X3 M40i with its inline six cylinder engine. However, this price is gonna be priced right around the same as a Porsche Macan, although the Macan is probably gonna be more when you factor in options. Me personally, I would probably just look at the Porsche Macan if I was gonna look at spending this kind of money or if you're gonna spend $80,000, you could spend around $10,000 more and get the bigger Range Rover Sport. And that's probably what I would do if I really wanted to stay in the Range Rover or Land Rover family. But with all that said, hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the revised 2024 Land Rover Range Rover Velar. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook. And as always guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.